I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. As we're going through Matthew's Gospel, today is actually the, the final portion of the Sermon on the Mount. Because we'll be starting in verse 13 and going through the end of chapter 7. So as you find your place there, I want to just maybe give you a, a context, maybe a mental place to start or to, to orient your minds. There's a phrase that people use sometimes to describe... A project, like usually it's, it's a home. Uh, I, I have some, uh, I have a friend, an acquaintance who he and his wife are in the process of uh, remodeling, redoing uh, a farmhouse that was built in the late 1800s. And so this phrase could very appropriately be applied to their situation. Here it is. The money pit. Right? You know, when I, when I say that, you know what I'm talking about, right? Because you, you, you embark on this process, this project. It's supposed to be fulfilling and, you know, fun. Uh, and then you get into it, and then maybe it's not. You know, maybe what started out is, oh, this is going to be so cool when we, you know, completely redo this house and it, you know, it was old and now it's new and it's renovated and remodeled and it just, it looks so amazing and it's still historical. You know, you have all these thoughts in your mind and then you start and you, you fix one thing and then you discover six more things. And you start to fix those and you discover a dozen more. And then, you know, what your, your budget as you started uh, grows and grows because you didn't, have full knowledge of everything that needed to be done. You find unforeseen projects within the projects, and you know, uh, money just keeps. You feel like you're just pouring it down a bottomless pit, right? Well, guess what? Spiritually speaking, sometimes I feel like. I am God's money pit. Sometimes I feel like just when I start to make a little progress and God works on me and fixes something in my heart, in my life, and as He's at work fixing something in me, He discovers a, another half a dozen things that are wrong. And, and it makes me wonder... How can God continue to be patient with me? How can God continue to pour out His Spirit and His love and kindness and His grace and mercy and continue to have all this patience when it seems like my life is just a money pit? I'm thankful that God has unlimited resources. I'm thankful that, that God is patient with me. I'm thankful He hasn't given up on me. Because every time I feel like I've taken a step or two forward, I, uh, something happens or uh, some situation arises and then I feel like I go back six steps. I don't know if anybody else can identify with that. But that's how I feel. And I just figured if I feel that way, I'm probably not alone. So today's portion of Scripture in Matthew 7, I feel like the title's pretty appropriate. There's two ways to live. And, and Jesus is going to go through four different sections of comparison in this last section here. But what it amounts to is this, there's two ways to live. We can live for Christ, we can follow the Word... We can do our level best to spend time in prayer and spend time in Bible study and spend time in fellowship with God's people and serving and trying to practice love and forgiveness and kindness and those type of things that uh, are supposed to characterize a Christian life. We can do all those things. But if the Holy Spirit of God is not in you dwelling and working and shaping and transforming, 
it's just a, a futile effort. It's, it's pointless. We don't possess the power, the strength, or the capability to transform our own hearts. Only Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit of God can do that. That's, all, that's the only way it happens. And so the only way we have hope in the midst of our struggle and challenges is to just lean into the Word of God, lean into the presence of God, and wait for His work to be fully realized. We have to cooperate, don't get me wrong. We cooperate all along the way. But God is working all the time. And so today we're going to consider Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 13. And as we do, my prayer is going to be that we will hear and understand and obey and be transformed by the power of God. The words will be on the screen to follow if you'd like to follow along there. Here's what... Jesus says, as he concludes the Sermon on the Mount, beginning in verse 13, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad, that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small, and the way is narrow, that leads to life. And there are few who find it. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. And every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against that house, and it fell. And great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority, and not as their scribes. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will give us understanding of what we've just heard. And Lord, I pray that you will give us strength to be obedient. Lord, help us to choose wisely as we stand at the crossroads. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I'm sitting there listening to the choir sing, and the words of that, of that refrain on that song, Who will you serve? What will you do? Take his hand. Jesus is calling you at the crossroads. Take his hand as you stand at the crossroads. Every day we're presented with options, decisions. What are we going to do? What are we going to choose? 
How are we going to live? And so, that's how I arrived at that title today, Two Ways to Live. But as we move through this text, I think it's really ironic how Jesus presents these two different situations over and over and over again. The first thing he shows us are two gates. Verse 13 outlines the wide gate. Verse 14 outlines the narrow gate. But look at the characteristics of our choices, our options that are placed in front of us. The wide gate is a broad way, so it's easy to travel, right? Not a lot of hurdles and and, uh, disruptions, it's just wide open. But look where it leads. It leads to destruction. On the other side of that coin is a narrow gate. And the narrow gate is not so easy. It's narrow, small, it could be difficult. But that is the way of discipleship and persecution. The interesting thing is the destination is life. Now as you see the descriptions, here's the interesting thing about this comparison. Look who finds each gate. The one that looks like, okay, I don't want any part of that one. That one leads to destruction. And what does Jesus say? Many, many enter through it. But then the one that's, a, the one that's attractive, that we want, because it leads to life. That's what I want, right? I want life. And, and Jesus says in verse 14, there are few who find it. And doesn't that seem wrong? Doesn't that seem backwards? It would seem like that everybody wants to go to the one that leads to life and not the one that leads to destruction. Right? That makes good sense to me. But it's just the opposite. Many go through the, the broad gate. Few go through the narrow gate. In other words, many people go to destruction and only a few people go to life. You know what it made me think of? Over in Luke, Jesus told a parable about the seed and the sower. You remember that? Throwing out seed and it falls on four different kinds of ground. Well, if you look at that parable, there was only one out of the four that bore any fruit. Only 25% of all the seed grew and, and bore fruit. And did what it was designed to do. 75% of the seed that was thrown out burned up, got choked down, didn't bear fruit at all. In other words, 75% followed the path to destruction. 25% followed the path to life. I don't, I don't like that. I don't like those statistics. But Jesus knows what he's talking about. Leon Morris wrote these words, The narrow road is far from an obvious way to go. It must be found. Now listen to this. No one drifts into the narrow way by chance. You know what that means? That means if you and I are left to ourselves, to our own desires, apart from God, apart from the Holy Spirit, we are not going to just wake up one day and, and come to this conclusion. You know, I really think I should follow Jesus. That's not going to happen. If we do what we want, we're going to eventually, consistently, go the wrong direction. If, we're, if we shut God out of the equation, that's what's going to happen. That's who we are. I don't know if you knew that. All, everything I'm telling you is right in here. In Romans 3, Paul wrote that there is none righteous, not one. There is no one who does good. There is no one who seeks after God. That's discouraging. You think we need Jesus? I think we need Jesus. There's two gates. Number two, there's two trees. 
two trees. Jesus talks about false prophets in verse 15. He says, beware. You see, each one of these sections kind of talks about having a, um, a command, um, an, uh, an admonition, uh, an encouragement to do something. The first one in, in the last two verses was, we need to enter, verse 13, enter through the narrow gate. Verse 15, beware. Beware of what? Or, or who? The false prophets. Because false prophets falsely claim to speak for God. Here's what that looks like in a real practical sense. Uh, it's, it's people who might have a, a position or a place to stand kind of similar to this. Uh, and they're standing and they're talking. But here, here's, here's how you can usually, not always, there's always an exception, but usually here's how you can identify what Jesus is telling us to watch out for. If I stand up here and I don't have this, and I just start talking, and maybe I'm telling you a story, or maybe I'm giving you an, an opinion, or maybe I'm giving you three steps to financial freedom, or five steps to a happy marriage, or, you know, whatever it may be. I, I've said this before, and I'm going to continue to say it. Nobody needs my opinion on anything. It's, you know what, I'm not going to tell you about opinions, but you know what they are. Everybody's got them. And most of them stink. You don't need my opinion. You don't need my advice. You don't need my suggestions. What you and I both need is a word from God. That, that's all we need. And so, those who would claim to speak from God, but don't open a Bible. Those who claim to speak from God, but aren't praying and, and, and seeking direction from the Holy Spirit. Beware. Watch out. They look like sheep, but they act like wolves. But Jesus says you'll know them by their fruit. You'll know them by their lifestyle. You'll know, their, know them by their actions. They promote division. They promote bitterness and ungodliness. And then he uses this, this uh, analogy from, from farming, from nature. You don't get grapes from a thorn bush. You don't get figs from a thistle. Those things don't grow that way. Now here's the interesting thing about two trees. The text says, I read it just a moment ago, verse 17 and 18, it talks about a good tree bearing good fruit and a bad tree bearing bad fruit. But you know what's interesting? That the Bible uses two different Greek words there in those verses, in verse 17 and 18. One's good and one's bad, but the other ones, if we were to, to say this literally, we're not looking at a good tree and a bad tree, we're looking at a healthy tree and a diseased tree. A healthy tree gives good fruit. A rotten, diseased tree gives bad fruit. That's, that's what is really in the text. That's what Jesus is trying to tell His audience. A healthy tree bears good fruit. Healthy fruit. In fact, it cannot produce bad fruit. But a diseased, rotten tree bears bad fruit. In fact, it cannot produce good fruit. But what is the disposition of these two trees? What happens in verse 19? Every tree that does not bear good, healthy fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So let's apply that to the people that we're talking about. Because Jesus said to beware of false prophets. That's really the focus here of this analogy about the trees, the false prophets. In other words, a, a healthy teacher, a, a good teacher, is going to open up the Word of God and read and explain the Word of God and apply the Word of God. This is what we do, right? Right? I heard a preacher in North Carolina say one time, there are two kinds of preachers. Those who preach the Word of God and those who need to resign. You can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. I don't, ha I don't have a word for you. God has a word for us. I, I don't have the answers. Sometimes preachers get kind of forced into that mold of, well, let's ask the preacher. He knows. He knows everything. No, no, the preacher doesn't know much of anything. But I can point you to the person who knows. I can introduce you to the person who knows. 
I can help you grow in your relationship with the person who knows. It's not me. We are, we are both in the same position. Okay? We, have, we might have different roles and different jobs to do in the church, but we are all in the same spiritual standing. I need Jesus just as much, if not more, than everybody in this room. Okay? So let's just let's make sure we understand who we are. A, f- a false, diseased teacher is going to bear bad fruit, and they're going to be ultimately cut down and thrown into the fire. Leon, Leon Morris said, People who run orchards do not put up with rotten trees. If there's no good fruit, there's no good reason for the tree to exist. See, th- this is who... This is who Jesus is calling us to be and what He's calling us to do. We're supposed to enter through a narrow gate that leads to life. And it's hard. And it might be riddled with persecution and challenges and hurdles to get over. But we're supposed to also beware of false prophets, false teachers. They come to you looking like a sheep, but they're acting like a wolf. Because they're leading you further and further away from true life, from that narrow gate. And he tells us what the disposition will be of those false prophets in the end. There's two gates. There's two trees. There's also two claims. In verse 21, this is maybe some of the most frightening scriptures in this passage. Because when you get to verse 21 and you start reading, Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. So I want to point out two words to you in verse 21. If you like to write in your Bible, these are worth circling. Okay, or underlining or something. Verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me. So I would circle the word says. But then he says, But he who does the will, I would circle does, the will of my Father who is in heaven. Not everybody who says to me, but whoever does the will of my Father. You know what that means? Anybody can talk a good game. What are you doing? What are we doing? This this is weeding out some false followers because Jesus says in verse 22, many will say to me on that day. You you know what uh, that word, many? You know where else we found that? We also found that up there in verse 13 when we were talking about the the wide, broad way and gate that leads to destruction, many will enter through it. But now, in verse 22, many will say to me on that day. And by the way, you know, it's almost like a, this is a good illustration from leadership. Because in leadership principles, if you have to continually remind someone or tell someone that you're the leader, then you're not the leader. You know how that works? You don't have to tell somebody that you're the leader. How do, you, how do, you, how do they know? You show them. You're, you're, you're acting. You're, you're acting your, your leadership. You're living out your leadership. Your actions speak louder than your words. So Jesus says, many are going to say to me on that day, well, didn't we do this and didn't we do that? Didn't we do this? What was your heart looking like? Jesus asks. Because in verse 23 he says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Sometimes trying to do work for God gets substitute for having a relationship with God. Well, I just want to do stuff and stay busy. Well, okay. What's your relationship like with Jesus? Because see, if we're trying to do stuff and that's our merit for salvation and forgiveness instead of who am I in Christ? What has Jesus done for me? What do I believe? And how does that inform what I do? See, you see the difference? So if we're trying to work with that, that's evolving or devolving into a works-based religion. i got to do these things in order to be favored by God. See, we don't work for victory. We work from victory. We don't work to gain our salvation. We work because we have been given salvation. 
See, Jesus didn't set a prerequisite for this cross when He went and died. He didn't say, alright, now look, if you meet these requirements and you do these things, if you check all these boxes on this list, then my blood will be applied to you. That's not what happened. How does a person receive salvation and forgiveness? How is someone saved by the blood of Christ? Surrender, repentance, belief, confession. Repent and believe the gospel. Confess Jesus Christ as your only Lord and Savior. He's the only way I'm going to heaven. It's nothing I've done. It's nothing I've said. It's nothing I can do. I can't earn it. Jesus Christ died for me and shed His blood and took a beating worse than any other man on earth. That's how I'm going to heaven. Because of Jesus. You all alright? Does everybody understand what I'm saying? There's no other way to heaven. That's not popular today. And maybe it would be worse if Jesus said, there's only one way. Good luck. That's not what He did. He said, there's only one way. Here I am. Come to Me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I will give you rest. That's what Jesus did. He's not hiding the one solution to our problem. He's openly proclaiming, come to Me. Repent and believe. See, when, when Jesus says these things, many people will say to me on that day, well, well, God, I did this. I went to Sunday school every Sunday. Perfect attendance, gold star, extra God points. I went to worship every Sunday. I even went, hold on to your seat. I even went on Sunday night. I even occasionally went on Wednesday night. Super spiritual right here. And you know what God's going to say? Well, that's nice. Jesus died for your sins. What did you do with that? We can't work our way to heaven. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way and the truth in the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. End of story. End of story. Jesus is the way of salvation. There is no other way. So when you say, well I did this and I did that, Jesus says, I never knew you. You never really knew me. Away from me. You practice lawlessness. He's quoting the Old Testament. This is just another example of how the New Testament just confirms and fulfills the Old Testament. Psalm chapter 6 and verse 8. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You've rejected God's law. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. I, this just shows you why I'm still being sanctified, right? I still I got work to do, and, and God's got work to do in me. Because here's what happens to me when I'm out in the community sometimes and I interact with people and they might, I say, well, do you, you have a church you attend? Oh, yeah, I, I go to this church. And they name a church. And so I can't just, <laughs> I'm, so, I'm wrong. I can't leave it at that. I can't, I can't just let it lay there. I have to say something, oh, you go to that? Oh, really? And see, and if they name a church that I know, then I know the pastor and I know about the church. I say, oh, really? You go down to that church? Who's the pastor in there? I can't remember. Let's see if they know the pastor's name. And then, this, um, yeah, I, well, I hadn't been in a little while, so I don't, I don't know, I don't know who the pastor is. I say, okay, well, what all they got going on down there? What, you know, what, what's happening down at the church? Um, I don't, uh, yeah, I mean, I just go every now and then. Okay. So, are you, is that really your church? Is that, I mean, I mean, let's just be honest. Right? I mean, that, if, if you don't know the pastor's name, if you don't know the pastor's name, that's not your church. Right? That's, that's, that's like basic 101. If you're going to tell me you're a part of a church, you ought to at least know the pastor's name. But that's just a real world kind of illustration of this text here in verse 21 to verse 23. 
I know I'm quoting the same guy, but he's got some good stuff, and I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Leon Morris wants more. To be active in religious affairs is no substitute for obeying God. The most orthodox avowals of faith have no value in the eyes of God if they are not translated into concrete obedience to His will. See, Jesus said in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, but the the ones who do the will of my Father in heaven. If if you're doing the will of my Father. How, how, by the way, how are we going to know the will of the Father? Right here, y'all. 66 books, guaranteed, Word of God. Right here. He is not silent. You, you want to wonder if God's speaking to you? Have you opened the Bible? God speaks. He has spoken. We cannot exhaust the riches of His Word. It's all right here for us. Two gates, two trees, two claims. Finally, number four, two builders. There are two builders, verse 24. You've heard this, I'm sure. If you've been around church at all, you've probably heard this story, this portion of the Sermon on the Mount. There's a wise builder, there's a foolish builder. And I want you to see that there's so much in common with these two builders. Because both of them hear the Word of God. And both of them get hit with the same storm. Look at the words in those verses. They're identical. He says, therefore. So after all this, therefore, if you hear these words of mine, that's the commonality. And then you look in the next verse, verse 25. The rain falls, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against the house. That's also in common. Because then if you look at verse 26, everyone who hears these words of mine, same thing. Then verse 27, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and slammed against the house. Same thing, right? What's the difference? What did you do with the word you heard? That's the difference. Verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them, or does them literally, does them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Then you go down to verse 26. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. So now you see the difference. we got some things in common, but we got a major difference. If you hear the word of Jesus and you do it, then you're wise and you have a solid rock foundation. If you hear the words of Jesus and you don't do them, then you're foolish. You, you have a sand foundation, which means, what's the result? When the rain falls and the flood comes and the winds blow and slams against your house, the wise builder has a house that doesn't fall. Look what the text says in verse 25. Because it had been founded on the rock. It's not because the builder used different materials or had a, lived a better life. It's not because of that. It's because of that foundation. The solid rock. Jesus Christ. But the foolish builder, when all those trials came in verse 27, that house collapsed. It fell. And it was a complete, total loss. Have any of you ever had the opportunity to travel down to the coast, to the beach after a hurricane? It'll give you some perspective. 1989, Hurricane Hugo. All the way up to as far as Sumter. The damage was terrible. Things that had been there no trace. Like I'm, I'm not talking about a pile of rubble. I'm talking about nothing. Like there was buildings and then it was sand. Nothing there. That's, that's a hurricane. Okay? That's a hurricane with a man-made structure. 
let's apply that thought to spiritual things, to eternity. Do we really want to gamble our eternity on anything other than Jesus Christ? This isn't a game. This is forevermore. That's what we're talking about. Are we going to gamble our eternity because we maybe are inconvenienced by the things of God? Well, I, I don't. I mean, I could go to church, but I got other things to do. Well, yeah, I know. I mean, I could read my Bible, but you know, it just takes so much time. I, yeah, I could. I could pray, but. You know, I don't really, it doesn't really do that much for me. Really? Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. Depart from me, I never knew you. Are, are we wise builders? Are we foolish builders? Are we hearing the Word and doing it? Are we hearing the Word and ignoring it? What are we doing? Because we have two gates, two trees, two claims, two builders. And you know, today with this last Scripture, I, I didn't want to try to just manipulate the text and come up with some point for the last two verses. So the last two verses are actually the conclusion to the message today. Because, you know, we, if you're following along, we've got two more verses left, 28 and 29. But you know what they tell us? It's when Jesus concluded His teaching. And it's a, it's a crowd, y'all. It's a big group of people. Their reaction is priceless. Because not only... Are there two gates, two trees, two claims, and two builders? And I didn't put this in the notes, but if you're writing them down, there were two reactions. Because the people heard all this teaching. Now you're talking about all the way back to chapter 5. Okay? The beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. These people heard all this teaching. And it says in, in the text, it says the crowds were amazed. But do you know why they were amazed? Because all, yeah, that's right, they, all they heard, they never heard that before. Never heard anything like it. Because the way Jesus spoke was not like the other religious leaders. Not like mortal men. He, the Bible says, this is the Word of God given to us through Matthew. When Jesus finished these words, the crowds were amazed because He was teaching them as having authority, not as their scribes. The scribes didn't have authority. Well, let, let, let me just tell you, I'll just repeat another quote. D.A. Carson wrote this, and this is really insightful. D.A. Carson said, The scribes spoke by the authority of others. Jesus spoke with His own authority. That's why they were amazed. That's why they couldn't believe what they were hearing. Because it, it influenced them far more than anything they had ever heard. Because it was God in flesh speaking directly to them. It's all the way back to Matthew 5 when Jesus would say, You've heard it said, and then he'd quote the Old Testament, and then he said, But I'm saying to you, this is what this means. Jesus has authority. So, so let's conclude. If that's the way our text ends, the people were amazed because he taught as one having authority, not as their scribes. So, so what's our uh, application? What are we supposed to do with that? Out of all these things that Jesus has said, all these comparisons and contrasts, the, the different things that he's compared, we're left with Ironically, a crossroads. There's two ways to live. You can take this word. You can be a wise builder. You can hear the words and do them. Then when all the storms hit your structure, it won't be damaged. It might, it might hurt a little bit, 
but it's not going to fall if your foundation is sound. What are we going to do with the Word of God? What are we going to do with the way of Christ? What are we going to do with the life we've been given? How are we going to live? That's the question we all have to answer today. We can't just hear this and then just say, oh, well, that was, that was interesting. Okay, um, so, all right, I'll see you next week. How foolish that would be. So I don't know, I don't know where you are today, and I don't know what God has impressed upon you while following this Scripture. But I can tell you this. Heaven and hell are real, and eternity is long. And there's only one way to, to, to go. There's only one way to life. There's only one way for forgiveness and salvation. It's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. That's the only way. We have no other option. Yeah, the way might be narrow. The gate is small. It's filled with difficulties sometimes but it leads to life. There's no, there's no real, real other option. I don't know of anybody who would just raise their hand and say, well, I want to go be destroyed. That would be great. We want life. Jesus wants to give you life. Jesus Himself is your life. Call on His name. Repent. Surrender to Jesus. That, that's what He's waiting. I don't know what He may be telling you in particular in your circumstances, but I know if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, that's what He's telling you. He's saying, come to Me. Receive My salvation and forgiveness. Repent of your sins. Surrender to Me. Turn away from your sinful ways. Come to Me. Let Me, let me fix your problems let me forgive your sins believe in Jesus that's what he's saying and if you are already a child of God and who knows what different circumstances you might be facing right now but I can tell you this Jesus already knows and he stands ready willing and able to walk with you through every step. Let me pray.